wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, Prince of Peace, mighty God is he. Saving me, keeping me from my sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer, praise his name. Praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, hallelujah, praise ye the Lord. Give me oil for my lamps, keep them burning, 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 give me oil for my lamps, I pray. Give me oil for my lamps, keep them burning, 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 keep them burning till the judgment day. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna, sing Hosanna to the King. Good morning. And good morning again. Uh, we are glad you are all here this morning. I'm not sure why you're all addressed in red, but we're glad you're here this morning. So. Uh, if you, are, if you are visiting us this morning as a guest of ours, we are grateful to have you. I ask that you stick around for just a few minutes, let us get to know you, introduce ourselves to you. Uh, if you are watching online, Facebook, YouTube, we're welcoming you as well. Make sure you leave a comment there so we know you're there. There are attendance cards in the seat in front of you. Uh, please fill those out. If you um, have any needs at all, prayer requests, things that you would like to share there, uh, information, address change, those sorts of things, please put that on the cards that you'll find in the seat in front of you. Uh, make sure you pick up a bulletin. Those are white this week, so there are many things in there we will not be going over. Um, but please be informed and also to keep people in your prayers this week. There's a list there in the back that has all the prayer list of people that are have asked for our prayers that we know we need to be praying for. So please, uh, please utilize that as a tool this week to be praying for those uh, both in the family here and those uh, friends and, and, uh, and uh, family members uh, elsewhere. Um, there are a couple announcements I want to just mention to you. There will be a Super Bowl party tonight, believe it or not, 530 uh, here at the church building. If you'd like to come up and, and join in that, uh, please do so. Make sure you bring a snack. Um, and come up in fellowship with the family here. Um, <clears throat> also, there were a couple of items that have been found here at the church building uh, that are mentioned here. I will just read those as they are. There's a pair of glasses that was found in the parking lot. Um, uh, and then there was also a couple of Bibles left here. Imagine that, someone leaving their Bible here. So, uh, uh, But there's a couple of Bibles left here at the church that are unclaimed. There's also some men's shirts and a stuffed Olaf that was found. And so... Uh, I even had to ask what that was. I didn't know, don't know anything about Frozen, but uh, I know now. So, um, but anyway, so if any of those items belong to you, make sure you pick those up this morning. So I want to ask you a question this morning. Um, what is your team? What is the best team? Is it the ch church? It's, it's the church. Who's the best owner? That would be our father, God, our father. The best coach is the Holy Spirit, guides us and directs us. And the best player, we all know who that is, that's Jesus Christ, right? We have the best playbook, the Word of God, right? We have the best playbook. We play on the best field, God's creation that he has made for us, all around for us. We're on the best team. We're joined by all the children of God, not only here but all throughout the world. What a blessing that is for us. A couple of things. We know that the opponent will be defeated. Satan will be defeated. We know that already going in. We are guaranteed a victory. We are guaranteed a victory knowing that we have the assurance of heaven. And our trophy is coming. Our trophy is life eternal with the Father above. What a great team that we play on as children of God. There are two things you don't want to do. You do not want to play for the other team. And you do not want to stand on the sideline. You want to get in the game of 
game of life, as, as, as he has asked us to do, not to stand on the sideline. So I want you to remember today to stay focused, keep your eye on the ball, stay committed, don't quit, work as a team, we need each other, and to remember the goal. So let's celebrate our victory this morning in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we are so blessed to be called your children. We are so thankful that you have, through the redemption of Jesus, set our sins aside, remember them no more. And yet we know, Father, that we still live in a wicked world, uh, a world that is not focused on you. And sometimes we are drawn to that and we ask for your forgiveness. We pray that you will give us strength and courage to fight the battle, to defeat Satan in our lives, to cherish the fellowship we have in each other, and to um, work diligently to bring others to Christ. Help us not to quit or give up, Father. Help us to remain in you. Help us to recognize the blessings we have of being in you. We thank you for this time we have to be together to build each other up, to worship your holy name, to, to honor you in our, in our song this morning, to hear your word come before us, to become alive and, and useful in our life this week. Just bless our time this morning together, Father. We thank you for loving us, and we love you back. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God is exalted, not by our desire, but by his essence. See what the prophets say about our God. Isaiah 21, 25, 1. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things, plans formed of old, faithful, and sure. 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above. Daniel 4, 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt, extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride, he is able to be humble. Hey, go ahead and stand up if, if you'd like as we praise God. You notice in that reading that even Nebuchadnezzar was forced to recognize that God was the exalted one. For thou, O Lord, art high of all the earth. Thou art exalted far above. Oh! 
Crown him with many crowns, a lamb upon the throne. Hark how the heavenly anthem drowns all music but his own. Awake my soul and sing, I'll give who died for thee.
scripture from 1 Corinthians um, chapter 11 uh, verse 17 and if you uh, are familiar with 1 Corinthians you'll know it's it's an interesting book because uh, Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and had some pretty specific things to share with them about you know some stuff that maybe wasn't going uh, in the best way um, and this is kind of one of those sections um, an interesting place to start this morning but but nonetheless. Uh, chapter uh, 11, verse 17 says, In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat, for you, uh, when you uh, are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers, as a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Uh, or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, uh, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you uh, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I think what was happening in the Corinthian church at this time is something that you know we can have some familiarity with, um, having divisions. Um, and essentially taking something that should be about unity and communing um, with our Lord and a reminder of his sacrifice to us um, and turning it into something different than that. So my encouragement this morning um, is while we take part in this, um, we take part in a way that um, elevates community and allows you to reflect upon the covenant that, that we all have made with Jesus um, and the reminder of the sacrifice that he um, has has made on our behalf. Would you bow with me, please? Father, thank you for this opportunity to, to gather uh, here with one another and in your presence, um, keenly aware of the sacrifice that you made on our behalf, um, a sacrifice that we were not deserving of, um, and yet um, it was made for us anyway. At this time, we're, we're gathered to partake in this um, Lord's Supper as a reminder of that sacrifice and as a reminder of the unity that you desire within us um, and a, a way to commune um, as a part of your body. As we partake of this um, bread this morning, please help us to do so with, uh, with respect for the sacrifice made on our behalf. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
with me again. Heavenly Father, thank you once again for uh, giving us this time of reflection, uh, this time to examine ourselves and our uh, commitment and covenant with Jesus. Um, and just allow us at this time as we partake of the fruit of the vine that we, uh, we do so uh, in a way that pleases you, in a way that honors um, the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf and uh, helps us reflect upon um, how we're doing with our with our part of that covenant. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and sing this one. Got to get things circulating and awake before who knows what Roger will do to it. How good it is when the family of God
who are here uh, with us live and those who are on live stream, it's good to uh, be with you. Good to have you with us as well. I want to thank Steve. He's already started a great sermon series up here this morning. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, there are those who say, you know, that other team, it comes from a place that's spelled with two L's. Dallas. That wouldn't be the team, okay? <laughs> Just saying. Sorry, Greg. Not really, but... Uh, at any rate, it's good to be with you this morning. I'm wearing my jersey this morning because, to be honest with you, I can't recall what lesson number we're on. It's somewhere between five and eight. I think it's seven. Uh, there may be those who think it's something else, but I think it's, I think it's actually it's six. It's six. Here I was thinking it was seven. It's six, I believe. But it's somewhere between five and eight. That's one of the reasons why I'm wearing the jersey. The next reason why, uh, I don't know. It seemed like there's a game today, uh, later. Uh, that has a little bit to do with it. Third reason is my boys and I used to talk a lot about football and playing football and those kinds of things. And, and when we did, they always wanted to be offensive stars, you know, catch the ball, run the ball, throw the ball, all that kind of good stuff. And, and I always encouraged them, listen, play on defense. It is more blessed to give the hit than to receive the hit, okay? So just, just play on defense. But I also am wearing this jersey because after years and years on planet Earth, I have eaten myself all the way to the offensive line, and uh, that happens if you're not careful. So there you go. Good to have you with us. Good to uh, be here today. We're looking at a lesson entitled Becoming a Church That is Good, and that could probably mean a lot of things. Uh, I'm glad it doesn't say becoming a church that's perfect. Uh, that isn't going to happen. Uh, we've, got, we've got some undoneness within us. But we do want to become a church that is good. We do want to become a church, hopefully, that is, is growing and that is improving. And that can mean a lot of things. And so what I'm trying to do today with this lesson is preach a lesson, teach a lesson that really complements well the life group material that is prepared for this week without really kind of stealing all of it. So I'm going to go in a little bit of a different direction maybe than that lesson for some of you. Don't let that throw you. I know Riddell, who wrote these lessons, told me a few weeks ago, I'm sitting here thinking, where are you going? And uh, Riddell, I wonder that too sometimes. Uh, so we're not alone, but, but where, where, and then he's like, oh, then you tied it all up really cool. That's what I'm trying to do today, so we'll see. Uh, I want to begin in Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5, we'll begin in verse 19, and we're going to read what is basically a foundational text for these lessons, and those verses say this, the acts of the flesh are obvious. No one needs to tell you these things are not good. 
No one needs to tell you these things are sinful. If you were going to define sinful acts, these would be the words you would use to define sinfulness. And that's what we're talking about. The acts of the flesh are sinful, you know, activities, are sinful behaviors. They're obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousies, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions. Goes on to say, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. See, that's where they include like Raiders fans. That's, that's kind of where that is. No, no. But going on, it says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's saying, listen, let me tell you something. There's that sinful nature about you. You and me. We, we, we have that. We possess that. We're very familiar with that. And we know when we act accordingly that obviously something is wrong. Obviously something has gone awry in our plan and our desire, hopefully, to bring glory to God's name and to serve him. And I'm just going to tell you right now, we, we are all sinners. We are all undone. We all have some growing to do here, me especially. But we got some growing to do here. But it then goes on to say this, but the fruit of the Spirit, also obvious, doesn't state that, doesn't have to. These are those acts that come down from God himself. They just kind of trickle down from the kingdom of heaven into our lives. These are the types of things we should be doing. And these very verses here, these next few verses, are exactly the foundation upon which these lessons have been built and intended. It goes on and says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, there's our word for this week, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. And so he's calling us to a different type of life. And he's calling us to a type of life that is obvious to us. Obviously, when we do these things, they are wrong. When we do these things, they are good and right and God-honoring. So what he's saying is this. Stop doing this stuff. Start doing this stuff. That's what he's calling us to do. I read something kind of interesting, and it talks a little bit about this this week, and so I'll share it with you. It says, in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit. Fruit here means beneficial results. I like that. It goes on to say, the good things that come from the Spirit's indwelling. As the Holy Spirit works in our lives, our character changes. Hopefully, <laughs> we improve. If you're not improving, then I've got some sad news for you. The Spirit isn't working in you. But if the Spirit is working within us, then we are improving. We are getting better. We should be changing, if you will. It goes on to say, Where we had harbored selfishness, cruelty, rebelliousness, and spite, we now possess love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Everything in the list reflects the character of God, and the goodness is the one that relates directly to morality. I like that. It speaks to me. And so as we read these verses, we're talking about change that inevitably must come to us. God wants his church to become good. He wants his church to grow and produce fruit of God-honoring behavior. He wants us to grow and quit being so, so selfish and so self-serving. And hopefully, prayerfully, that's what we'll do today.
So today as we look at goodness, I want us to see four or five things today. Again, five, five to eight, I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes this morning. But I want us to see about, about four or five things this morning. Number one, we begin in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. I want us to see this idea of sowing goodness. Not sowing with a needle and thread, but sowing with seeds. I mean, we're talking about something that grows. We're talking about something that produces fruit. I think it's only natural that we should talk about something that is sown. And that's kind of cool because Paul has told us by the inspiration of the Spirit in chapter 5 about this fruit of the Spirit. And then we get over here to chapter 6. And remember, when he wrote the book, he didn't write it in chapter and verse divisions. We added those later. I understand why we did. But I think that part of what we're going to read here is, is Paul's and the Spirit's continuation of the thought from chapter 5. It says here in verse 7, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. And that's true of women too. I mean, I think we as human beings reap what we sow. We may not always reap it in real time, we may not always reap it in our time here on earth, but make no mistake, you will reap what you sow. God will see to that. And I'm not just saying that as a cautious warning, although that is a pretty good cautious warning. I wish I had thought about that a lot younger, a lot sooner in life. I wish I thought about that more often in my adult life. You will reap what you sow. Now, whether that verse scares you to death or thrills you really depends on what you're sowing. So if you're concerned this morning, you might want to consider sowing different seeds. And so we read these, this verse. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Now, I don't know about you, but when I put that in my notes, I always highlight that and I bold it and I italicize it, and I underline it, and I change the color to red. Why? Because red means stop or hit the gas, right? That's what red means. When you're driving a car and you see that red light, it means you're supposed to stop now. These are the things I want to stop. Conversely, the next few words, they're also bold, italicized, underlined, and they're in green, which means go, do these things. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. I don't know about you. I don't want to reap destruction. I want to reap eternal life. And it's not complicated. It's not hard. It may be challenging. But it is rather simplistic. If I want to reap eternal life, I have to sow seeds that are in step with the Spirit. Let us not become weary in doing good. I like that. Sometimes we do, right? You ever been tired of doing good? Sure you have. I get a lot of people tell me that. I'm just kind of tired of trying. I understand. I feel like I give and give and give in a world full of folks who take and take and take. I get it. It's easy to become weary in doing good. But this verse reminds us, don't do that. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. It may not be in our time frame. It may not even be in our time on earth. But God will see to it that we reap what we sow. And that to me, friends, is why sowing goodness is so important. It goes on to say in verse 10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Not to everybody. We want to get them all. We want to do good to all people, especially to those who belong in the family of believers. Now, I want you to know something. If you think we're just to do good for our church brothers and sisters, to our church family, to those that we are home with here on planet Earth, you're missing part of it. He's saying you be good to all people. You so good with all people. You know, sometimes we wonder, well, who am I supposed to do this for? Everybody. Everybody. Let me make it simple, God says. Just do good things for everybody you meet. <laughs> And if you do that, 
you're going to reap. God will see to it. So I want us to think this morning about the idea of sowing goodness. Because I want you to know something. You're sowing something this morning. Throughout this week coming up, just like last week, we both sowed something. What did we sow? I would like to think that last week I was a pretty good representation of Jesus Christ here on planet Earth. I would like to think that I had more good moments than I had bad moments. But I don't know. Ultimately, God will judge that. And what I reap will be the evidence of it. And this morning, I can't go back and I can't redo last week. I may want to, but I can't. What I can do is this. I can say, this week, I'm stepping up my game. This week, I'm going to sow more goodness. I'm going to sow those things that we read about in chapter 5 of the book of Galatians. I'm going to sow those things that more accurately represent the nature of the God that I serve. I'm going to sow more of those things that God's Word is calling me to do. And if you don't know what those are, i got good news. Our second point is knowing goodness. I don't know about you. I've probably got some things to learn here. I want to know what to sow. So in order to do that, we're going to read Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. And we're going to see a lot of things we can sow. So we're going from sowing goodness to knowing goodness. And here we go. Number one, verse 9 says this. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. You know what he's saying? Don't wear fake goodness. I love this jersey. I love this jersey because I like the player. You know who wears it for the Chiefs? Creed Humphrey. He's our center. He played at the University of Oklahoma. Boomer Sooner, baby. I love that. There's one thing I don't like about this jersey. And so I kind of hate to point it out to you, but I know you'll keep it to yourself, okay? I've got this Super Bowl patch right here. You know when this Super Bowl patch is from? It's from the last time we played the San Francisco 49ers in the Super Bowl. You know what Creed Humphrey's part in that game was? He was a spectator because he was still in college. You see, this is what happens when you buy a Chinese jersey. <laughs> if I wash it, I won't have to worry about that patch anymore. It'll fall right off, okay? But this is kind of fake, all right? I got to admit, it's kind of fake. But hey, what do you expect for like 20 bucks, okay? And 53 months waiting for it to come in, okay? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, you know, it's, it's a bargain, but you got to be patient. Uh, so, we don't want to wear fake goodness. We've all done that before. We, we've all acted good for a little while, wanting to reap really, really, really soon. And then we grow weary from that. And so he's saying, no, no, no. What I'm calling you to, well, I want you to know this. This is a lifestyle. This is challenging. So we've begun with... We must be sincere. None of that fake stuff. None of that cheap, you know, Japanese knockoff stuff, okay? Sorry to our friends from, from Japan or China. Moving on, verse because we need to. Verse 10, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Like that. Verse 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You ever seen someone that would just really positive, and you could tell they really loved Jesus, and they loved other people. Man, those are good folks. Those are the kind of folks we are drawn to. Why? Because they have a level of goodness that we respect, that we value, that we want and even need to emulate. Verse 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Hey, man, when there's challenges, do these things. They're good. Verse 13, share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Well, I like that. Again, we're talking kind of about our forever family. And so sometimes we think 
God's calling us just to be good to the good. Well, that is not correct. Because first of all, none of us are that good. But second of all, look at the very next verse. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Those aren't always the good people. Sometimes they are. That's not always the church. Sometimes it is. It doesn't matter whether they're on the pew with you or not. We're going to strive to be good for all that we come in contact with. Verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. That is goodness in practice. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of lower position, and do not be conceited. Some about humility here. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And verse 21, love this one. This is probably the great summary verse of everything we've been reading. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The article that I was reading this past week says this of goodness. Goodness is a virtue and holiness in action. It's virtue and holiness in action. I like that. It spoke to me. It's a result of a life characterized by deeds motivated by righteousness and is a desire to be a blessing. We want blessings, but God's calling us to be one. And goodness is certainly the, 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 the paved pathway to being a blessing. It's a moral characteristic of a spirit-filled person like that. And so I want us to think about sowing goodness. I want us to think about knowing goodness, but I also want us to know about growing goodness. Here's a familiar passage to us. I think we read this last week in Lesson 5 to 8. Uh, we read it last week, and it's uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 27 through 36. I'm going to read it every week till we just start doing it. That's probably my, my strategy. But no, let's read this verse one more time and look at it from the standpoint of growing goodness. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to anyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Suddenly, this sounds like a very radical definition of goodness, doesn't it? This is not how I display my goodness at all. Well, I've got some work to do here, church. I listened to someone this week, and they said something that I thought was insightful. I've been thinking about it, and I want you to think about it too. But they said this idea of turning the other cheek is not about being some masochistic person. Oh, psh, you hit me with that one? Okay, can you, can you do a better one over here? It's not so much about that. If you've ever been slapped, you know how challenging it can be to keep your calm. Someone smacks you on the face, let me tell you something, that cheek kind of heats up, doesn't it? But you know what burns hotter than that feeling of your flesh? The thoughts, the intents of your heart. Because then they become challenged, and they become bitter, and they're intent on revenge, and they're going to do something about that. And so turning the other cheek isn't so much to say, okay, just let people beat you up. Become the world's doormat. Let them beat your brains out as much as it is about this. When someone slaps you, and you feel all that bitterness and all that anger and all that rage and all that heat of emotion, 
turn the other cheek, which is cooler, which is calmer, which has not experienced that hurt. Think about that cheek for a moment. Let that cheek lead you and guide you toward a path of goodness. I'm going to tell you something. It's going to be a whole lot easier for me to be good this week if when someone slaps me, and I hope they don't, but if they do, I better not be thinking about what just happened over here. I better be thinking about how different this cheek is, how it feels calm and cool. Now, it's it's bothered about what's going on over here, and the more I think about what happened over here, the more this cheek's going to probably turn over here. He's saying, no, no, no. I want you to be calm. I want you to be peaceful. I want you to think about how can I use this differently. I like that. I want us to look as well at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. I know we got a lot more verse there. I think you're familiar with it. If you're not, keep reading it. We read it last week. We'll probably read it next week too when we do lesson 5 to 8, wherever we are next week. But, but this week I want us to look as well at Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, where we see the idea not only of sowing goodness and knowing goodness and growing goodness, letting it grow in us as it needs to, We're going to show the idea here of showing goodness, what it illustrates, what it means, what it displays. Here he says in verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty? Again, it is no longer good. That's interesting that that word pops in there. It's no longer good for anything. We lose our goodness when we lose our saltiness. Now, you got to be careful about that word salty, right? It's come to mean a couple of things. I'm not, enough of us are practicing salty in a negative connotation. I'm talking about practicing it in a way that is flavorful. I'm talking about practicing it in a way that preserves things. Salt really kind of changes everything it touches, and hopefully in a good way. That's what we're talking about here goes on to say, it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on the stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. This idea of light really helps us see this concept of showing goodness. And if you've missed it, then read this next verse. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and what? Glorify your Father in heaven. They're going to see what you are doing, but they're going to glorify God. Why? Because they're going to know that you're letting Him live through you. And that's goodness at a level that we rarely achieve. As the author of the article said, goodness is not a quality we can manufacture on our own. I thought that was interesting. He alludes to James chapter 1, verse 17, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of light. I like that. We'll look at that verse in more detail in just a moment. This certainly includes a life characterized by goodness. In letting the Holy Spirit control us, we are blessed with the fruit of goodness. As others see our good works, they will praise our Father in heaven. We've got to do more than just sow it and know it and grow it. We've got to show it. Because when we do, People see not only our goodness, but more importantly, they see the God that we serve that put that there, that allowed it to flourish, that allowed it as only he can do to bear fruit. And that's what we're talking about. So in conclusion, beautiful word conclusion, right? James chapter 1, verses 16 through 18 talk about this idea of allowing goodness to flow to flow through us, from God above, through us, to others. And it simply says this, Do not be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change 
like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. And God wants our fruitfulness to be on display in such a way that the world will look at our goodness and see that that's just his fruit. And that's good stuff. So this week I want you to think about sowing goodness. I want you to think about knowing what it is and learning more about it. I want you to think about growing in that knowledge. I want you to think about what you're showing when you practice goodness. And I want you to think about having it flow through you. The neat thing about wearing kindness, goodness, displaying that for others is guess what? It'll fit all of us. You know, this jersey may get too tight. I don't know. It keeps shrinking, Ken. I don't understand it. It may get too tight. Goodness can feel too tight sometimes. But it looks good on you. And it'll always fit. And then lastly, our goodness must be genuine. It has to come down from heaven above, course through us, and be shared with others, all others, even those difficult people, for it to be genuine and for it to be real. Have a good week this week. And more importantly, be good this week. Because when we are good, and I mean truly good, we are closer to the nature of God than we ever are. Thank you so much. You can see that I'm uh, celebrating the Chiefs, right? Mitch, I've got, I've got Chiefs overalls on. They're red and yellow. He, he can see them, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I can see them. <laughs> yeah, yes, I've been healed. Um, Roger, I really appreciated your, your sermon this morning. Um, uh, the encouragement to be good and to allow the Spirit of God to work on us so, as the methodology for us being good. Um, we're, you know, we're all, um, we're all, there's a lot of us wearing chief stuff. You saw Rogers, there's lots of red, there's lots of yellow, there's even a little pink over here. <laughs> At least Leonard's got pink on in spirit, you know. Um, uh, and what, and, and, and the why is because we're celebrating Chiefs going to the Super Bowl. You know, I hope tomorrow we'll be celebrating a win. I feel confident, but, you know, it is what it is. We'll see. Um, but we're celebrating. And we're celebrating this morning in lots of ways. Uh, we're celebrating because God has told us to be good that God has told us to be a community of his people that display the various things, various attributes of his spirit, of God's spirit, working through us, changing us, molding us, that kind of thing. Um, uh, we're celebrating. Do you remember that our mission statement included the idea of celebration? Our mission is to be a people who seek to glorify God and serve others by engaging, inspiring, challenging, obeying, and celebrating. We celebrated the Lord's Supper a moment ago. And um, what we did was we remembered and we celebrated the idea that God loved us enough that he saved us even when we didn't deserve it. When we were fighting against him, when we were the kind of people that Roger was talking about that we shouldn't be, we, are ce we celebrated that. So I would encourage you to, um, uh, as we think about these kinds of things, to remember what God has done for us and then celebrate it. Whether it's wearing funny-looking bibs that feel funny and 
you know, all this kind of stuff, whether it's when we're rallied around the TV tonight watching the Chiefs game, you know, and hoping that they win. But more than that, it's when we have those reflective moments, hopefully every day, when we're thinking about what God has done for us and how he wants us to live in response. And I think if we do that, the Spirit will bless that. God will be proud of us rather than ashamed of us. And we will then, as our vision statement talks about, reflect Jesus. And that's what he wants us to do. So let's respond as we live our lives. Let's allow God to work through our lives. One way is to be good. Allow the Spirit to help us be good. And if we're good individually, we'll be good as a congregation of God's people. And thus, we will be reflecting God. Um, I would encourage you to seriously think about the words that have been spoken this morning. Rogers, and I so appreciated the songs you, you, you have led this morning. Um, our, our time of reflection on the Lord's Supper and Casey's comments. Um, and I pray that you will um, think about how we can reflect Jesus, how we can let the Spirit of God work on our lives and be the kind of people that he wants us to be. If you can, um, would like the elders, as you know, we scatter the elders around the auditorium so that um, we can pray with you, you can pray with us, and we would love to do that. Um, if you would like to respond and make the decision to follow God by being baptized today, today's the perfect day to do it. Um, I can get these bibs wet if we want to, you know? <laughs> um, um, if we can help you in any way, um, let's do, come, come and come talk to one of the elders as we stand and sing this song.
say.